pulls his trench coat like aside <laughs> to reveal his pocket, like almost to reveal that he doesn't have a gun. I guess is what he's doing. Like, but but as he as he pulls the trench coat aside, there's literally like a like a whoosh. There's a whoosh sound on the soundtrack. He pulls out a weapon, Carolyn, and that yeah. weapon is his legs <laughs> of fury. Yeah. Ah. Uh. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 8 of Cinema Ball. I am here with my co-host, opponent, and the hardest target of all, Carolyn Pettit. Hey Carol! Hello, hello, hello! Cinema Ball is a ridiculous excuse for Carol and I to talk about movies. Our goal in this game is to connect one movie to another through actors, directors, foley artists, whatever. Our goal movie in this round was the 1998 Jean-Claude Van Damme film, Knock Off. This summer... Jean-Claude Van Damme. Knock off. In this round, Carol was on offense and tried her hardest to get us to knock off, while I was on defense doing absolutely everything in my power to stop from having to watch that movie. Last week, I had us on the edge of our seats as we waited for impending nuclear doom via the China Syndrome. And Carol decided to keep that tension high and go for the field goal option by booting the cinema ball into the bayou. That's right. She aimed for the hard target. (laughs) At the end of this episode, we're going to give you a tantalizing tidbit to whet your appetites for round two. But for now, Carol, let's laisser le bon temps rouler. Start us off. (laughs) Ah, oui, oui. uh... In the city of New Orleans in a darker side of Dixie, away from the music and the lights. There's a new game in town. You'll be provided with a guide, trackers, and the weapons of your choice. I need to file a missing person report. The competitors are deadly. We pride ourselves in hunting only combat veterans, men who have the necessary skills to make our hunts more interesting. They always win. So Hard Target, uh, 1993 film, which is uh, which was John Woo's first American film. And um, according to uh, a Wikipedia anyway, it was also the, um, the first major Hollywood film made by a Chinese director. Of course, a lot of movie buffs know John Woo as the director of some legendary Hong Kong action films such as The Killer and uh, Hard Boiled, mm-hmm. um, with which all... Um, both starred the very soulful actor Chow Yun Fat, you know, Mm -hmm. who just would make, just seeing him on screen, yeah, uh, just, just like makes the film (laughs) vibrate with some kind of, you know, soulful energy. Yeah. Um, and of course, John Woo's uh, style is very, it's very distinctive. It's, it's, uh, you know, marked by certain things like doves and slow motion and, oh yeah <laughs> yeah and, and 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 certain like specific shots types of shots um so anyway um uh yeah so for this first hollywood film um uh john woo wanted kurt russell to, to play the lead but kurt russell was uh either too busy or just you know pretending to be too busy because <laughs> maybe he didn't want to do this film and so the uh universal's first choice was jean-claude van damme and john woo finally you know said okay we'll go we'll go with jean-claude and um and yeah so so we have uh john woo's first hollywood film hard target the basic premise of hard target for anyone who hasn't seen the film is that you have um uh, Lance Henriksen as a man named uh, Fouchon, and Fouchon is a man who appreciates. Uh, <laughs> just, of all the movies that yeah. we could have ended on, I know, I this know, this was so like it was yeah. just um, a delight. It was yeah everything yeah, I, I needed in uh, yeah, ninety six exactly. minutes. You know, yep. so I'm, I'm yep. sorry, but I'm gonna bust out into laughter yeah. every couple yep. of seconds during this That's... episode because Lance Henriksen. Oh my God! Yes. He yeah, did yeah, not yeah. meet a scene that he did not want to savor. Yeah. Oh man, does he? Oh, he savors everything in this film. So you have yeah, Lance Henriksen as as Monsieur Fouchon, 
uh, a man who appreciates the finer things in life. He appreciates, um, you know, looking really angry and intense while playing the piano. Um, He, you know, and of course, he appreciates uh, hunting humans. And so um, he runs a service for very wealthy people. Um, where they can pay like five hundred thousand or so to experience what it's like to hunt a human being, and they hunt uh, particularly homeless, you know, combat veterans who have like no family or you know anyone who might look for them or be be worried about them, and uh, so um, uh, yeah, so that's kind of how how the film starts. Uh, what what winds up happening is this is uh, a woman uh, played by Yancey Butler comes to town looking for her father who uh, happens to be the most recent uh, target and uh, who was killed in a recent uh, hunt of Mr. Fou- Monsieur Fouchon, Fouchons and um, Jean Claude Van Damme uh, sort of gets uh, uh, embroiled in this and ends up uh, sort of going head to head with Fouchon's gang himself. Um, uh, worth noting too that another member, uh, like like Fouchon's right hand man, named Van Cleef, is played by Arnold Vosloo, who I mean, there like to give you an idea of how of how John Woo this movie is. Um, so there's a, a a moment where where uh, Van Cleef appears, and Van I mean in the Arnold Vosloo just is in this film just is so good at looking like like incredibly menacing Mm -hmm. you know like and um but there's one moment where he turns up and there is on the film's soundtrack there is a completely like non-diegetic sound of like thunder rolling (laughs) like like it's like the weather outside is totally fine you know we see when when they come in we see when they leave but but Vosloo uh, Van Cleef shows up, and you hear this like thunder roll. On Even the, on God the soundtrack. is scared of that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to give you a sense of of what the kind of style, the kind of heightened style that we're that we're dealing with here. This movie um, was um, both Arnold Vosloo's character and Lance Henriksen. So the movie came out. What year did you say? Nin- Nin- 90, 93. Yeah, and I remember at one point I uh, was watching Lance Henderson stride toward the camera um, in his just inimitable villainous way. And, you know, I was like, wait a minute. Are they sure this movie didn't come out in the 80s? Because there are so many things that, you know, remind you of a kind of like quintessential 80s action movies. And even like Arnold Vosloo's character, who is made even more villainous by the fact that he gets to use his native South African accent. Like that was right. such a, you know, kind of like a dog whistle for villain, you know, in that totally. period, yeah. right? Yeah, but I, I mean, I wonder if, 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 that is a result of I, I wonder if Jean Wu's sensibilities to some degree and, and this is just me speculating I, I have no, no nothing to back this up but if they were in some way formed by you know 80s US mm-hmm. action movies but then him taking elements of them and really making them his own by you know by by ramping them up by heightening them but also just lending his own like stylistic uh, yeah. uh flair to them so so that maybe maybe that explains why there's something reminiscent of the 80s about about this film yeah i am i am so intrigued um listener i did no research on this movie i watched it i wanted to immediately watch it again um i wanted to marry this film but i did no actual research on it so i'm learning as you're learning from carol about this so i had no idea about kurt russell being um, John Woo's uh, initial like preference for this film, and immediately when you said that, I could see a version of this film with him in yeah. it. Yeah, right. And- I mean, the thing is, like Kurt Russell would have been a probably a more convincing actor in the role because there's something utterly absurd about about <laughs> John Claude Van Damme as a Nolens drifter mm-hmm. named uh, named Clance Bou- uh, Chance Boudreau, right? right? I mean, he 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 doesn't. I mean, what he does have, but he's way way better, I think, at like kicking people than oh, Kurt yeah. Russell would have been. Mm-hmm. And and I mean, like, uh, there's so many, there's so much good kicking in this movie. Oh there's God. a, there's a, there's like, 
There's a moment where it's in the final, uh, like the final showdown between like where Jean Claude Van Damme is kind of picking off Fouchon's henchmen one by one. There's one encounter where he, where, uh, where Chance shoots a bad guy, you know, several times. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy is just kind of standing there, like he's obviously about to just collapse dead because he's been shot so many times. But just for fun. Chance goes ahead and like kicks him to the to the ground. Oh, yeah. It's and <laughs> when he when when Chance uh, near the end of the film kicks a gas can at one of the henchmen and then yeah. shoots it, I knew that I was never ever going to be the same. Which is not to say that this film solely relies on its kick power. Uh, this film also features a scene in which Chance punches a rattlesnake. Yes, <laughs> the, yes, he. <laughs> Right. So he punches a rattlesnake. And the best thing about that to me is the way that the obviously like animatronic rattlesnake head sort of like slowly (laughs) droops down (laughs) after that. Like, oh, like he's just kind of going, taking a nap or whatever. Oh, it's he was, magic. Yeah, that, that snake note was in the presence of greatness. But I do have to ask you immediately after that scene, you know, uh, once the the like the the trap is sprung and activated by um uh, by some of the bad guys and you know they get the the snake to the face then Lance Henry and Fouchon you know mm-hmm. grabs the what remains of the snake I, I think and says like I'll fuck you and then eat you do you remember that line <laughs> I couldn't parse I, what that yeah. meant like who is yeah. he talking to is he talking to the snake is he talking to the guy that just got bitten by the snake is he talking in his head to chance also what does that mean yeah, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a Fouchonism. It's, you know, I mean, I was like, Fouchon is just constantly browbeating uh, the people, like his own henchmen yeah. and even the people who have paid $750,000 for the privilege privilege yeah. of hunting chance. I, I mean, the way that he, he's just so, he just never lets up on those people <laughs> at all. Um, so... I want to say, though, so I forgot because I, I saw this film. Literally, I saw it when it was in the theater. So that's mm-hmm. that's like 25 years ago now. And um, so what I sort of forgotten about it is how for I think the good first hour or so, I think the film the film seems to have, I mean, layered into its absurd action movie premise and everything. I feel like there's a bit of like a genuine concern for for Nolans, the city, and mm-hmm. for like the homeless people, yeah. like the for the class for the class issues and the oh, e- yeah. economic issues affecting that city. Like there's a there's a moment. Um, I think it's I think it's when Yancey Butler is talking to uh, uh, the friendly Ripper. You know, black. What's his name? Is his name Ripper? Is that the one you're thinking of? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and and you know, Ripper is like just talking about. Um, like homeless people and you know, like different shelters and stuff. And it's like, there's like this shot it, as he's talking, it just kind of shows what look like citizens of, yeah. of the city. I mean, not meant people who are in any way involved in the plot, but, mm-hmm. and people who don't even in context look like actors. They, they look like they're like, could be actual residents of the city who are suffering as a result of, of economic uh, depression so for me, there's a sense in which, like about an hour into the film, it when when uh, Chance and um, Yancey Butler and like head out of the city and the kind of final, you know, sh- things ramp up to the final showdown. To me, there's a sense in which the film becomes less interesting because mm-hmm. it turns because at that point it turns into like just the all out like action film mm-hmm. and totally abandons its its earlier concerns with class and with um you know, with homelessness and with, with Nolans as a city. Yeah. I think I, I, I really loved that too. And I actually was a bit unprepared for it because, you know, as I said, I I didn't know anything about this movie going in. Um, so I had no idea what it was about and what tack it was going to take. And, you know, like the brief two second summary that I read on Wikipedia, you know, click through to see who the writer of it was. And it turns out the writer of this film is a former Navy guy. Right. 
And so you'd be forgiven for thinking that it, the film would have a kind of, you know, deeply conservative undercurrent. And in a way, you know, it, it is concerned with like, you know, real men and what constitutes oh, legitimate, absolutely. you know, masculinity, right? But I think there is actually a kind of like, you know, provocative and progressive argument there about class, about the way we treat veterans, for instance. Like, you can laugh about the fact that there's this human hunt that goes on and that apparently there's no shortage of like combat that trained veterans who live on the street. But then you think like, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. You know, like there's a lot of those dudes on the street. Yeah, the film definitely seems sympathetic to them. It in no way blames them for mm -hmm. the situation in which they've, they find themselves. If anything, it seems to be blaming the absence of social structures that are not there to provide the, the the necessary support to those people. Yeah, when Fushona is talking to Ripper to get him into, to you know, to invite him into the game, and he says, listen, you know, you can take your chances with this, or you can go listen to, you know, uh, an hour and a half of fire and brimstone to get a bowl of soup, you know? And it's a very, right. like, very cutting moment. And before that, of yeah. course, there's, you know, he's talking in his, his blousey linen all shirt and his all white, uh, you know, piano room and he's talking about how like oh hey by the way we're just doing what the police and the military yeah. already yes. do all the time which is have carte blanche to kill people yeah. and i was like That's i right. was kind of blown away i was like yeah yo this yeah. movie is kind of right on he literally says that police kill without with impunity and all they're doing is is offering that privilege to private <laughs> citizens <laughs> right you know for for a for a handsome sum mm -hmm. um so the, uh, yeah, that that line definitely, uh, I think, resonates perhaps more, you know, even more now today than it would have at, at the time. But yeah. um, I, I'm glad you you mentioned the the way the film is uh, concerned with, or or the way in which it it reinforces a kind of hegemonic masculinity. There's one line. Let me see if uh, if I I think I made a note of it. Um, yeah, while you're looking for that, I will say that towards the end of the movie, when they were actually in, uh, okay, I'm probably going to mess up it, the bayou, the swamps, whatever, right? Sure. Like, there's a version of this movie um, that is set anywhere that we assume real men reside, right? So, like, the Wild West, the mountains, you know? Right. Uh, like, any sort of, you know, like, away from civilization, um, and away from like the civilizing and thus feminizing um, effects on on men. Like there's a yeah. version of this movie. Like you could have literally picked up this exact movie, swapped out Wilfred Brimley's accents and his you know <laughs> aphorisms for something more associated with like you know ranch life, and that you could have had this movie set in Wyoming. Yeah, and I mean Lance Henriksen. Even there are points in the film where he says like, oh, you know, we we need to like pack up here and move on soon. Oh, I know Eastern. We'll go to Eastern Europe, like mm -hmm. that being an, another place that that you know certainly at the time in the public consciousness had a had perhaps a sense of like lawlessness yeah. a, a, about it, and um and and, and also there's a moment where um so hit the client who's hunting um uh that character whose name I I don't remember um. You know where he like they haven't he hasn't had his head start yet or something. So the client goes to shoot him, and you know, but that's like a violation of the sacred you know rules of the hunt. <laughs> right. So Lance, so Lance Henriksen sort of pulls the gu the gun down, and he says, he says something like, "This is." This is New Orleans, Mister So and So, not Beirut. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. well, that's a well, that's a fucked up thing to say about Beirut, uh, honestly. Yeah. Like, um, but to go back to uh, the our our point about um, hegemonic masculinity, the, the 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 point, the line I was trying to remember was that in that conversation about the money that uh, that the contestant could mm -hmm. you know potentially win, which of course they'll never get away with, right? Um, which which is only ten thousand dollars. Which yeah, I mean is you know consider that the client is paying five hundred thousand yeah. dollars. So this is like it's literally chump change that they are even offering the contestant, right? But one of the things that Lance Henriksen says in trying to get him, you know, to participate is that this money will quote make you a man again. Yes. Um, and of course that on top of the fact that twice in this film. 
chance, Boudreaux, the Jean-Claude Van Damme character, uh, uses uh, <laughs> boyfriend cracks to, like, insult uh, mm-hmm. the bad guys, right? Like, yeah. like uh, suggesting that the that the uh, that their thug cohort or whatever is is their is their boyfriend as like an insult yeah which, eh, so so yeah i mean there's definitely the ways in which this film is is uh, yeah is yeah, sort of reinforcing i kind of appreciated that um because it felt so real to me that the stakes mm. are so high or that the, the right. cost is so high but the potential gain you know, objectively is so small. So, you know, we can't forget that, you know, the amount of money we're talking about at the very beginning, for instance, when, um, when Yancey Butler's character first offers Chance the, um, a a job helping her find her father, she says, okay, I'll pay you a hundred bucks a day, you know, um, as if to get him to not ship out. And then when, uh, when Chance hears his name called, he's about to go board a boat as an able seaman. Turns out he hasn't paid his union dues. He has, he doesn't have the money to pay him, so he can't ship out. And the amount of money that he's down is $217. And so like, these are, even in 1993, right? Like it's, it's, from the outside, depending upon your perspective, that can sound like such a small amount of money. But if you don't oh, have it, oh, uh, if you absolutely. don't have it, it might as well be a million. And so, like, the fact that Completely. that money belt, you know, had $10,000, it sounds kind of ludicrous. But if you don't have anything approaching oh. that, it might as well be a million dollars, oh. right? You know, and so I kind of oh, I kind of appreciated that because there, there could have been, like, there's a version of this film where they offer the contestants something so you know, just right. out of the realm of, you know, possibility, knowing that they're never going to have to deliver on it, you know, right. but they, they, they drop something, you know, entirely ludicrous as an option in yeah. front of them, but that isn't even necessary. Like, to be honest, there are some guys, you know, who have participated. If they had said, we will give you 500 bucks, they absolutely would have taken that. Run. Yeah. Oh, completely. I mean, no, I think you're right. You're out. You're a hundred percent right. So it's that it's an amount that, that from the contestants perspective it is, I mean, obviously, tremendously life changing, like, mm-hmm. um, but is so is also relative to what Fouchon and his men are earning right. is still ins- insultingly paltry, yeah. right? Because because they exist in entirely different spheres mm-hmm. of wealth and yeah and and money. Yeah, I found this the the setup just to like talk about the hunt for a minute. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted. <laughs> This, you know, reveals like what a horrifying person I am. But I wanted more of the hunt. Like the hunt is almost secondary, right? Um, Yeah. And so I wanted a bit more of it. But also there were times when I thought that there you're making this uh, deliberately hard on yourself in a way that doesn't seem like it would add to the challenge of this event. You know, like, you know, those movies where there's like a, a hidden a secret island somewhere and they import people and, you know, set them loose and people go chasing around the island. Yes. If, if I were a completely morally bankrupt zillionaire, for some reason, that seems more fun to me than this version. Like, it, it just seemed like, I don't know, you're, you're making things a bit hard for yourself. And also, where is the concern for secrecy? You know, like they, they have a, a town doctor who's falsifying autopsy reports so people don't know what's going on. And then, and you know, the next scene, they're trying to, they shoot down, uh, his name is Roper, not Ripper, but they shoot down Roper, like in the middle of a street, you know, yeah. um, in front of everyone. It, it couldn't be more, you know, open and just declaring, you know, like the I'm above the law. I, I just, I didn't get the rules of the game, yeah. even within this universe. Right. That's, that's true. And, and I would have liked, it, it did seem to me that that Fouchon and his crew, given that they have, I mean, they have these men on motorcycles who, mm-hmm. who basically like always have the quarry in their sight. And it's yeah. almost impossible for the quarry to, uh, to escape them. I mean, I felt like, yeah, it, it's how much of a hunt even is it really? Like, like it would have been cool to see more of like a kind of tracking, like, like, mm-hmm. like figuring out how to track the person, like those aspects of, of the hunt. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another, uh, yeah, another thing that that um, I mean, it's I suppose it's just something we we as audience members have to accept walking into a film like this. But to me, it seemed even more pronounced in in this film than it does in a lot of films. Is um, I mean, uh, Fushon and his crew when they're hunting people, uh, like um, like the 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 man in the in the uh, in the opening sequence, 
um, and then this, their second uh, target. They are like they seem extremely skilled and accurate a lot of the time. But then, of course, when when it's Jean Claude Van Damme attacking them, I mean, like they fire so many bullets at him <laughs> and 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 just miss like all the time. And yeah. while Jean Claude Van Damme is doing. Things that make him a pretty, you know, <laughs> excuse you know, the, the question, like easy target. Uh-huh. Like he, like there's a one point at which he's like, I mean, some of the stunts in this film are, you know, it's a John Woo movie, so they're right. wonderfully outrageous, right? But there's like one moment where he's like, he he's on a motorcycle and then like, oh god, he, sta- <laughs> he like stands on the motorcycle and he's like balancing on the motorcycle as it's still moving forward. Yes, and I mean, oh, and then yeah, like hits the hits the truck head on. Yeah, uh, slides over the top of the truck. Yeah. yeah, and then shoots the motorcycle, which has been leaking yeah. gasoline like right. underneath the truck. I was again yeah. this movie. Yeah. <laughs> I want to watch it again right yeah. now. I mean, I there's was- a lot of inventiveness to to yeah. some of the uh, the the fight sequences and the um and the sort of vehicle combat and gunplay sequences. Um, yeah, yeah. But man, I mean, again, just to emphasize how how woo this movie is i think like there's a there's an early encounter with the, so so the reason that the thing that brings chance and um the yancy butler character together in in the first place is um that w- is that she's uh harassed you know by a few uh jerks outside of a of like a restaurant after they've seen that she's carrying a lot of cash with her so they're like assaulting her and and he like comes comes to her rescue but there's a point like before they start throwing b- blows at each other uh there's one moment where where John uh where Jean-Claude Van Damme sort of pulls his trench coat like aside <laughs> to reveal his pocket, like almost to reveal that he doesn't have a gun. I guess is what he's doing. Like, but but as he as he pulls the trench coat aside, there's literally like a like a whoosh. There's a whoosh sound on the soundtrack. He pulls out a weapon, Carolyn, and that yeah. weapon is his legs <laughs> of fury. Yeah. <laughs> For some uh. reason, that scene tickled me so much because he was wearing corduroy pants. I don't know uh, why right. that 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 particular costuming note tickled me, but it, it, it just did. It, so much of this it, it seems to be um, shot on a stage, right? So like in the beginning of the movie, I was like, okay, this is the sound stage somewhere. This is not actually yeah. <clears throat> New Orleans. And similarly, as I said, with very few modifications, this film could have been set anywhere. Obviously, you have the, I, I don't even know how to describe him, but Wilfred Brimley in this movie, bring in the Cajun karate. And oh, just yeah. Really, yeah. you know, making a go of it with his, his moonshine and his folksy wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, the, the folks that we come across in the city before the action really kicks off, there's just, there's very little, you know, Louisiana there. And I, I, I wondered if I would have wanted, like, if more would have yeah. added even more atmosphere to this movie. So we get very little background about Fouchon, the main villain, and his main henchman. We get, yeah. you know, very little about Chance. We get very little about anyone. Like, the point is to get to the ass kicking, right? Um, yeah. yeah. There's This is not, a, like, a character study or anything. And yet, I kind of wanted to know... If you're going to tell me that Mr. Chance Boudreau, as played by Jean-Claude Van Damme, was raised by his uncle Duvet in the bayou, did he learn that Cajun karate in the bayou? Or is that a product of his military service? Like, I want to see him setting more traps that are more like, you know, kind of backwoods, you know, right. kind of yeah. traps. I guess I wanted them to make a little bit more of that, that Cajun history. But we totally. got what we got, and I still, I yeah. still loved it. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it, there's little moments of, I mean, watching this film, and and you know, where, where you when you have the the locations like the restaurant where uh, outside of which um, the Yancey Butler character is like assaulted and things like that. Like, I I, I really enjoyed the sort of Nolan's like 
just style and like flavor mm-hmm. of those of those locations and um I, you know i wish we'd gotten more of that i remember there's like one moment where uh somebody asks chance if he ha- if he has like a bottle of hot sauce <laughs> on him. Like, that was his good buddy uh, roper <laughs> yeah 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 uh-huh. oh i was like okay cool yeah cool um yeah yeah I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, no. I mean, I, I don't. Mean, I don't say this to suggest that the movie is somehow lesser than, but I do think like there's a you know the platonic ideal of this movie in my head um, still you know stars the same people. Like I, I when I saw Lance Henriksen, Lance Henriksen and Arnold Vosloo occupy a, a similar category for me in that they are character actors that I am always delighted to see but I always have a slight twinge for them because I think you're never gonna play the good guy you know like yeah you're never in your career ever gonna play like the corn fed you know like (laughs) handsome lead or you know like um you know a politician with integrity you are always gonna be exactly what you're playing and you play it to perfection but yeah. there are depths to you i'm sure but we're, we're never gonna get to see him but come on lance hendrickson arnold Vosloo, casey lemons are you kidding oh, me come on even though yeah. i kind of hate it you know like there's some cop uh strike going on right so there's that weird scene where we see the picket line and they're changing mm-hmm. without cops the city stops and then okay whatever we'll, we'll come back to that but it's apparently her birthday she's one of the few cops in the precinct uh, Yancey Butler's character comes in and says, hey, I'd like to make a missing person report. And Casey Lemons is like, can you come back tomorrow? I'm and I'm like, <laughs> someone just came to you and said they want to make a missing person report. <laughs> what? Yeah. No, that's not okay. <laughs> and there's that great no. sign behind her, behind her desk that says, it's not the hours you put in, it's what you put in the hours. Clearly, absolutely zero from this officer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and, and yet... I mean, of course, Casey Lemons. I mean, when, when, yes, you say it's like her birthday, and before Yancey Butler shows up, she has this little moment to herself where she gets out this little cake, you know, and she's she's got like a, a candle in it, and she's just like, you know, acknowledging her birthday to herself, and it's this really sweet moment, and uh, God, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I was very frustrated with the way that I, I feel like this film totally wastes Casey Lemons. Yeah. Um, yeah. The director so. of Eve's Bayou, which hopefully exactly. will make it into a future round yeah. of cinema ball. Because yeah. I would love to chop it up with yeah. you about that film. Yeah. No, Eve's Bayou. I mean, I, again, like that, I saw that probably 20 years ago mm-hmm. too, when it, when it came out, but I know. Yeah. So C- Casey Lemons is, is not just a, an actor. She's a filmmaker in her own right. And Eve's Bayou, if you haven't seen it, is is a is a really uh, great film by her. Of course, I still uh, tend to think of her as uh, Clarice Starling's girlfriend from Silence of the Lambs. Oh, but that's shit. Just, of that's course. just me. That's just yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. No, man. They what a couple. I know. Ooh. Right. I'm going to so go write that hot. fanfic as soon as this episode yeah. is done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and I like yeah the police strike. Another th- sort of throwaway thing in this film that would have maybe been would have made the film more interesting if they had explored it a little a little more, right? Like yeah, it doesn't. We just see the cops picketing outside of the police station, and so I guess it sort of hints again at the the larger theme of uh, the economic uh, sort of failings, you know, or or struggles that. Nolan's is experiencing as mm-hmm. a city on perhaps like every level, but um, yeah, it's it's you know it's just again it's just it's such a throwaway moment, and the film doesn't doesn't really develop it or do anything with it. Yeah, I <clears throat> excuse me, I wish I had seen this like you when it was in theaters because I can't imagine what it would have been like to watch this film and and be introduced to John Woo at the beginning of the period where, you know, we kind of knew his name and and could anticipate and look forward to his style. 
in films as opposed to me looking back on it now in 2018 and you know seeing the um the way that other directors have you know copied his style you know to see the way that he's grown as a director you know there's there's always you know that little bit of sadness that i i am not i didn't see this for the first time and get to enjoy it you know when it was fresh and new because this would have honestly blown my mind things that i look at now and they seem you know kind of cheesy or cliche were absolutely not viewed that way then you know it's right. just that we've had the benefit right. of 25 years of you know films since this um you know 25 years of films doing something similar you know growing evolving etc being you know a bit more polished uh that that i can look back and say that but this absolutely is not I, like if i had seen this in 1993 i would have immediately started cosplaying as chance boudreaux everywhere <laughs> <laughs> i went yes I mean, the film, it is interesting how the how Wu uses the camera and uses slow-mo and everything to clearly try to lend Chance Boudreau that kind of mythic figure status that, you know, you might attribute to, say, a Clint Eastwood in, a, in an old spaghetti western or something. Like, shots, again, just shots of him, like, maybe with his back to the camera, you know, the, his, his coat just cutting a, a, a sharp, uh, line, uh, you know, f- uh, for him and and him just like turning his head to the left a little bit so you just see the side of his face, like these very deliberate, just just uh, uh, very um, uh, deliberately crafted images to to yeah to, to to lend Chance Boudreaux this kind of power on screen as just like where where. There's something about him that where just him, just the smallest movement from him because of the, the you know, the slow-mo or the sound effects or whatever can seem to contain all of this, uh, this like dormant power within him, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I I could talk about this movie for another 17 hours, but I think we should move into a yeah. rapid fire round of Fab Five slash Furious Five. Um, this is where we give the audience a quick taste of those things we loved, hated, <laughs> couldn't stop thinking about, were confused by. Maybe we talk about how we immediately started writing the sequels, <laughs> whatever. So, Carol, give me your yeah. your your five. Okay, so mine mine alternate back and forth between Fab and Furious. So let's start with a uh, Fab. Um, okay, there's a moment. There's a character in the film that we didn't talk about. Who um, he uh, he he sort of helps Fouchon uh, find the uh, the uh, the veterans, the homeless veterans oh, yeah. that they will hunt, and he all like he he employs veterans by having them pass out like flyers for his like a uh, phone sex services or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, uh, like there's bad blood at a certain point between this character and, and the Fouchon crew. And so at one point they show up while he's sleeping and the way they wake him up is Arnold Vosloo. <laughs> like, so the so the guy's like sleeping on his back, right? He's sleeping on his back, and Arnold Vosloo, like silently, you know, walks up to his bed, like kneels uh, in front of him, and does a straight like ha, like karate chop right into the guy's stomach. It's it's kind it's hilarious. Oh, oh man. Yeah. Um. Uh. Number two, Furious. Uh, I mentioned this already, but um, I, I was I was really frustrated by again the, the way that I think this film wastes uh, Casey Lemons mm-hmm. and her character. Like I think that there could have been an interesting arc there from her sort of disinterested uh, uh, reaction initially to her becoming much more like invested and helpful. And you know, I, I think it would have been a lot more interesting if she'd been around and and somehow kind of supporting uh chance and um yancy butler throughout the film as opposed to them just like killing her off you yeah. know when when they take in the, these moments to to like develop her character a little bit to give her uh some kind of personality um i just yeah i thought that was a shame yeah. uh number three uh fab of course punching the snake um just i mean <laughs> i think one of the 
all-time great uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme cinematic moments. Uh, uh, number four, Furious, again, the, uh, you know, the your boyfriend repeated your boyfriend cracks uh, just irked me a little. Yeah. Uh, I, I I think they um, certainly date date the film somewhat. Mm-hmm. Um, but finally, uh, a, a fab number five. Um, so obviously, I've talked throughout the uh, the cast about how I how I enjoy the you know the John Woo ness of it all. Yeah, I was particularly excited by a specific shot, um, and it's a shot. It's a signature John Woo shot. It's a shot that's used in. Um, I know, in, I know what this is, and I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, it's a shot that's used certainly in the Killer, and I think it's in Face Off at one point as well. But it's the shot. It's a shot in which. Um, you have so on the left side of the screen, you have uh, Chance standing with his back against a wall, and on the right side of the screen, you have uh, Van Cleef, Arnold Vosloo, standing with his back against that wall, and you're you're like seeing a you're seeing the wall is like cutting right down the middle of the screen, and so you're seeing Chance on the left, like reloading his guns and preparing for the the inevitable gunfight that they're about to have. And you see Van Cleef like doing his preparations and they, they probably, I think they like exchange a few words, you know? And then of course, when the moment comes, both of them like synchronize, like turning around and starting to shoot at each other through the windows that are right there. I just, there's something about that shot that every time I see it in, in like a John Woo film, I just, I just love it. That's that's so funny because you are absolutely right. Like that that scene and you know the versions of that scene that we get, I I love too. I thought you were gonna go in an entirely different direction and uh-huh, talk uh-huh. about where Chance is um, in his like you know <laughs> cold water walk up, leaning you know in the, oh. the French windows, and a dove and flies in the yes. window. It's, yeah. you know, slow motion heads yeah. towards his dog tags. And if, I, I don't remember if a boozy saxophone started playing, but it really should have because it was, yeah. it, it's such a like, you know, soft focus moment of reflection. You know, it's one of those few moments like where, where men in these films, you know, get to have a kind of like emotional moment uh, before things snap back to regular speed and regular mayhem. And I think you can also think of it in a, in a, in an abstract sense, at least of uh, uh, really of like a, a little nudge or message from God to chance, Mm -hmm. like being like, Hey, you have to keep doing, I know that John Woo, um, considers himself, I think, a man of faith. You know, mm-hmm. certainly he uses like church imagery along with the white, along with the white dove imagery in so mm-hmm. many of his films. And so, I, you know, I, I think that for him there is a you know a, a spiritual element to like when the whenever the doves like appear in one of mm-hmm. his films. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so my uh, Fab Five, and they are all things that I that I just was delighted by in this film. Uh, one, the Sam Raimi cameo. Uh, so Sam Raimi was a producer on this film, and he makes a cameo as a person that uh, that Roper tries to get help from once he's been shot. He's you know on the hunt, and Sam Raimi giving it his Sam Raimiest in his brief two seconds on screen. <laughs> Loved it. Wasn't prepared yeah. for it. <clears throat> Jean Claude's hair in this film. I don't know why I I was so delighted by it. I think because it was such a change from the shorter hair we normally get from him. But there was there, yeah. this was just a power mullet. I I don't yeah even, absolutely. If, if you do yourself a favor, if you've not seen this movie and you aren't planning on it, just at least do a Google image search for Jean-Claude in Hard Target because it is, it's something. And when you said, you know, that this film, um, initially John Woo had Kurt Russell in mind, this is Kurt Russell hair. It's not what I associate right. as JCVD hair, but I was into it. Although it seemed like a lot of product for a guy who doesn't have a lot of spending money. Um, I love the, uh, the, the sayings in this film, uh, many of them from Wilfred Brimley and his brief appearance, 
that I just could not figure out. Uh, yeah. Point her titties north and step on the gas was yeah. one. Um, good whiskey make Jackrabbit slap the bear. <laughs> that was also a really I mean, good one. I think that's pretty clear. <laughs> it is. But, but, you know, but then, um, and, and um, you know, combined with the other ones, like the I'll fuck you and then eat you from Fouchon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like sometimes, you know, they, they really hit it. With these sayings, sometimes they really didn't. Um, yes. I really was, this actually should be my, my one furious five, but at the very end when <laughs> JCVD throws a grenade down Fouchon's pants, you know, right? Right. And then, you know, dives away. Fouchon has enough time to pull totally. the grenade out of his pants and then... Does not like, throw it away, but tries right. to like pulls the fuse out. Thinks that he's managed to pull the fuse out and that he's gotten one over, and of course <laughs> gets blown up. But I was yeah. like, why would you? If he had th- just thrown just it throw away it. aside, he would he would have survived. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, that's my my one complaint about the movie. But then the final thing, uh, the credits under um, uh, the song "Born on the Bayou." Like, it, there's nothing that this movie does. Uh, subtly, right? Like, no, a, no. The, John Wu and th- this film, nothing is telegraphed. It is faxed. It is emailed. They put up billboards to let you know what's coming. So to have that kind <laughs> of on the nose, um, but absolutely fantastic, you know, just like butt rock over the end credits. Yes. I give it a chef's yes. kiss. I absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, speaking of, you just used the term faxed, though, which reminds me of the line in in, a, in the film that also really dates it, is that Van Cleef at one point tells one of their clients, like, never never mention this arrangement on the telephone conversations or via telex. <laughs> That's right. And I'm like, <laughs> like yeah, well, you know, everyone, everyone... <laughs> Who sees that movie in the Stay future? Stay off the telex. Is be like, yeah. what the? What is telex? What the fuck is that? <laughs> exactly. Uh, oh boy. Yeah. All right. So now it is time for us to render our verdicts on this film using my brother's patented 100 star scale. As a reminder, yes. we rate all the films we watch. We then update the list of our ratings in the document you can find in the podcast description. So, Carol, hit me up. Where do you rank Hard Target? You know, it was it was tough for me to land on a rating because this was. It's one of those films that everything that I liked about it made me real made me think about how oh how the film was in some way so close to being a film that I would have liked a lot more if if only yeah. it had like done things a little differently. So it's that kind of frustrating thing of like oh it's I really you know enjoy watching it it's fun, um, but I also just see all this like potential for it to have been. Uh, uh, you know, even even more, even better if it had been if it had been a little uh, more deliberate about uh, if it had been a little more deliberate about its thematic concerns or you know something. Um, so I'm gonna have to go and give it like a 65, but it's like a it's like a recommended 65. You know, it's like a film that I I, I want people to watch. I think it's it, it's style makes it well worth watching it's you know it's fun it's got ludicrous moments that you will never forget uh like see john claude van damme punching a snake but um yeah but i also feel like oh it, it's it's not quite like an action classic and it mm-hmm. but it it could it could have been you know yeah that yeah. remarkably similar to my rating i am giving it a 67 which is pretty low Uh, Or seems like it would be pretty low for the ebony scale because I always rate things super high. But this is, it's like, shows promise. If I was a teacher grading this, I would be like, I really think you've got some great stuff to work with. Just give it another pass and you are going to have some absolute magic because the, the kernel of what is the, the, the center of that hard target. Yes. So good. Absolutely so good. It can only get better. So, yeah. So with this film, so, uh, you know, it was coming down to the wire. I was, if we had gotten to episode 10 and I hadn't scored yet, a possession was going to be handed over to Ebony and I'd be scoreless. So rather than continue to try to make it to knockoff, I took this opportunity 
given that Jean-Claude Van Damme is in this film, to convert it into a field goal. So I'm now on the board with three points, which is less than the five points you get for a full goal, but is still puts me on the board, which means that, um, that when Cinema Ball carries on, we will have a new goal film. Ebony will be on offense. I will be on defense. I do not know what the goal film is. So, Ebony, when we come back for round two of Cinema Ball, what movie are you going to be trying to, to get us to? Okay. Listeners, Carolyn, <clears throat> I labored mightily to determine what direction we should go in for round two. Now... Carol and I have very similar tastes for some things and wildly disparate tastes uh, on others. On the one hand, I wanted us to be forced to anticipate having to watch another horrible film like we would sure. have if we had gotten a knockoff. On the other hand, I thought, wouldn't it be great if there was something that we thought was wonderful at the very end? A prize, if you will. Yeah, In absolutely. the end... I didn't go either direction. I decided okay. I want you <clears throat> to have to watch a movie that was one of my hardcore favorites when I was a child. You and I are both 80s babies, so yes. I don't know if you saw this when it was in theaters, but I have seen it approximately one million times. I could watch it one million more, so I'm going to be pushing hard to get to this. The film we will be trying to get to... Uh, and uh -huh. round two of Cinema Ball is the 1985 Matthew Robbins classic starring Helen Slater, Christian Slater, Peter Coyote, Yearly Smith. I'm talking The Legend of Billie Jean. Oh, my God. <laughs> Deep I... cut. Deep wow. cut. It is a film with an absolutely phenomenal Pat Benatar soundtrack. So I All anticipate right. that if we get there, we're going to have lots to talk about. Um, but this yeah. movie, just a powerful 80s touchstone for me. And awesome. easily available on Amazon. Folks, get into it. $2.99. <laughs> I can't so think of a better way to spend three bucks. This is, this is an, a sort of iconic 80s youth film that I have heard of, but I have never seen. Oh, um, man. Yes. I have just one question. I've never thought about yeah. this before. Are Helen Slater and Christian Slater related? Apparently not. Okay. All right. Okay. Just thought I'd ask since they're both in this film, right? Yeah. Helen Slater. Wow. Mm -hmm. Supergirl, right? Supergirl? Girl? Yep. Supergirl yeah. and also um, co-starred in another 80s favorite of mine, The Secret of My Success with Michael J. Fox. Oh, there was just a period sure. where, yeah, Helen Slater, she was my girl. Loved her. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, all right. So, you know, when when, when Cinema Ball returns, uh, of course, I will, uh, Ebony and I will agree on a, a starting film mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, hopefully will not make Ebony's work too easy. And so look forward to that revelation when Cinema Ball returns. That's right. So that is going to do it for us this week. Thank you so much to Simplecast, which hosts both this podcast and our flagship show. Are you listening to our flagship show? You better. Feminist Frequency Radio is waiting for more radio heads. We will see you back here in a couple of weeks for another heart-stopping round of Cinema Ball. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> All right. All right. Cool, cool, cool.